Hey everyone, today um, we're going to learn how to describe a plot. And this is RL 6.3 and our standard says describe how a particular stories or dramas plot unfolds in a series of episodes as the plot moves toward a resolution. So in a story, the plot is the series of episodes or events that make up the story. These episodes are moments in the story that are driven by the conflict or struggle that the main character tries to overcome. Like a trail of footprints, the episodes in a plot lead to the resolution or to the end of the conflict. So let's take a look at these pictures. So when you're looking at these images, um, the first thing we notice is that there was a, a storm, and when the storm at sea um, came about, it caused the boat to crash. And then these survivors are faced with the problem of how to get home, so they write a message to signal for help. And then you look here, and it says, there it goes, our last chance for rescue. So they send off um, their message for help. So let's take a look at how this is like a little plot mountain. I'm sure you've heard of a plot mountain before. Um, we start off with number one, an exposition. An exposition introduces the characters and the setting and it sets the stage for what's gonna happen. So in this particular case, a storm at sea causes a boat to crash on the rocks on a tiny island. And then we have the rising action. It's the events in which a conflict is introduced and problems increase leading to the climax or the turning point in the story. So in this particular story, search planes miss the island despite the survivors' efforts to signal for help. So this leads us to the climax. And the climax is, is the turning point. This is when the big event takes place. And in this particular story, supplies are running out as their last resort. The survivors send a message in a bottle. And then this takes us to the falling action, which is events that lead to solving the conflict. A fisherman from a nearby island finds the bottle. And then the resolution is the final outcome. It tells what happens to the characters after the conflict is solved. So we're going to assume that the fisherman rescues the survivors. So in most stories, one event leads to another unfolding in a way that increases tension and it builds up to a turning point called the climax, the moment of greatest suspense, surprise, or excitement. Think of a plot as a roller coaster ride. The events move you up until you reach the very top and then they send you zooming down to the end of the story. All right, so let's take a look at a story and let's um, try to describe the plot um, in terms of exposition, conflict, rising action, and climax using this part of the story. Alma's First Cattle Drive by Nancy Siego. Blinding lightning flashed across the sky, followed by deafening thunder and driving rain. Alma had grown up listening to her father's astounding stories of cattle drives. She had always wanted to join in, but her father told her she wasn't ready. Now she was finally given her the he was finally given her the chance to prove to him that she would be more help than trouble on the trail. This was her first cattle drive, and the weather was Alma's first challenge. When they reached the river, Alma instantly noticed that the water was dangerously high. When the cattle began to cross at a shallow spot, Alma was the only one to notice a calf getting swept up in the current. Alma charged into the water and stopped her horse downstream from the calf to keep it from losing its footings. All right, so on the end of grade test, um, a question for this standard might sound like this. How does the story's plot build to a climax? So... Let's think that through. One plot episode leads to the next until Alma must act, and the critical moment is the climax. So the exposition, which I said was the setting or, or the characters, Alma goes on her first cattle drive, but a terrible storm has made it dangerous. So she's the character, and she's on this first cattle drive. This is the setting, and the setting also um, means what's going on around the place, and that's a terrible storm. 
So that moves us into the conflict. The conflict is that Alma struggles to prove herself to her father and keep the animals on the kennel drive safe. So um, here it told us that she had always wanted to go on this cattle drive, but he wouldn't let her. He said she wasn't ready. So the main problem is here is that Alma wants to prove herself to her dad that she can do this. So rising action would be um, where the conflict leads. Um, and what's going on in the story is this calf starts to get swept up in the high water. Nobody sees it except for her. So let's write that right here. A calf gets swept up in high water. Now, this is building to the climax. This is where uh, Alma is going to have uh, the opportunity to prove herself. If she can save this calf and if her dad sees her doing this, then this is going to be a really big deal. This is going to be um, proving to him that she's no trouble at all. She's more help than she is trouble. So here, the whole climax is that she protects this calf by stopping her horse downstream. That's pretty fast thinking. So I would say she's definitely ready. So as we read the story's ending, we're going to think about its resolution or how Alma's conflict is solved. Her conflict, now you can't get confused in what's going on in the story. Um, the calf also is, is in a bad situation, but the conflict itself is that Alma is trying to prove herself to her dad. So how does she do that? How does she solve that? Um, we can use this little close reading um, section here to help us think through what we're about to read, think through the ending. Um, the close reading helps us focus on the conflict and the falling action or what happens that leads us to solving the conflict. So let's just read it. It says on page 54, Alma's quest to prove herself is challenged when the weather creates this dangerous situation for the cattle. Find and underline the sentence here that shows the end result of Alma's efforts. So we're going to underline how this ends. Alma stayed there in the stinging rain, her horse breathing hard beneath her. She was cold and hungry, but she kept her horse on the edge of the shallow riverbank until each animal had safely passed. When she finally rode ashore, her father waved to get Alma's attention. He paused for just a moment to tip his hat to her before they continued. Alma knew then that she had proven herself to be a valuable member of the team. So this is when she knew. He tipped his hat and he smiled and this let her know that she had proven herself. So let's take a look at this hint. It says, the final part of the story includes the resolution. This is our resolution. Remember that the main character's problems are usually solved at this point. Now, here's what the story, uh, here's what a question might sound like. Which sentence best shows the resolution of the story? All right, how it was resolved. A, she was cold and hungry, but she kept her set her horse on the edge of the shallow riverbank until each animal had safely passed. Um, B, Alma stayed there in the stinging rain, her horse breathing hard beneath her. C, when she finally rode ashore, her father waved to get Alma's attention. Or D, Alma knew then that she had proven herself to be a valuable member of the team. Now our question is, which sentence best shows the resolution? So out of all of these, which tells us that it was resolved? Um, <clears throat> A and B are obviously inc incorrect because they're describing the falling action, not the resolution. But if we look at C, Alma's father waves to get her attention so he can acknowledge the good job she did. This is still part of the resolution. It doesn't, but it doesn't best describe the whole resolution. 
um, D, Alma knew that she had proven herself to be a valuable member of the team. This is, the story's conflict involves her quest to prove herself to her father. So this is the part that tells that Alma knew she had proven herself to him. So this D would be your best answer. Okay. So today you are going to um, have a passage that you're going to read. And it's called From Black Beauty. And there's going to be some... Um, action conflict that takes place in this story and you're going to answer questions in a Google form um, that will allow you to practice um, identifying the resolution, the problem, the conflict, the rising, falling action. Then the second part of your form is going to have you determining word meanings, figurative and connotative. So let's talk about that just for a second. Um, and this is RL64, so we're still reading fiction. Determine the meaning of words and phrases as they are used in a text, including figurative and connotative meanings. All right, so we're going to use this little picture here to help us um, talk through different um, parts of figurative language uh, and think on connotative meanings. Last week, last Friday, um, your notebook entry, you were given um, similes, personification, metaphors, all of these things um, for Nightboat to Freedom, and you were to interpret them. So we're going to do a little more of that today. Would you rather trudge through the snow or stroll through the snow? These two verbs, trudge and stroll, have similar meanings, but each has a different connotative meaning. The feeling suggested by a word or a phrase. So the connotative meaning is what type of feeling do you get when you read that word? For example, trudge connotates a struggle or connotes a, a struggle. But stroll suggests a relaxing walk. So you get two different feelings. Either way, you're going through the snow but if you're trudging, you're struggling through it. And if you're strolling, then it's just relaxing. Writers also use words in imaginative ways to create interesting effects. This kind of language is called figurative language. Figurative language often makes unusual comparisons between things or ideas that help you to imagine a subject in a vivid or unexpected way. So let's take a look at this picture. Tears fell from her face like rain from the sky. So why do you think the writer compared the girl's tears to rain? It's not likely that water's pouring from the girl's eyes, but the writer wants us to know that she's crying hard because when rain falls, it could fall hard. And so she, we're comparing tears to rain and we're using the word like so that tells me that this is a simile because similes often compare two things using like or as. Um, so for an example, she has a smile like sunshine. All right. Smile is being compared to sunshine. Um, Sunshine brightens someone's day. A smile brightens someone's face. So um, this simile is um, indicating that it's bright and it's cheery. All right, a metaphor is a comparison that doesn't use like or as, but still comparing two things. He is a bear of a man. So this is telling me what I know about a bear is a bear is large. I mean, he's, he's big and broad, could be tall. So this man is probably a large man who's tall and broad. But notice it's comparing these two things, but there's no like or as. So that makes it a metaphor. And then personification, as we talked about last week, giving human qualities to something who, that's non-human, an inanimate ob object. The boiling tea kettle screeched its complaint. Um, the word screeched um, 
could mean sounded. It, it's just sounding like this tea kettle is, is whining or a complaining person. Um, and we know that a tea kettle can't complain. But the sound of it made it sound as if it were. So readers identify which ideas are being compared and what they have in common. They also consider the feelings that words create to appreciate what an author is trying to say. Um, let me go back up to connotative meaning just for a second. A couple more examples of that. Um, kind of went on a little bit fast with that. But um, you could say the word smell. Or you could say, what's that smell? Or you could say, what's that fragrance? The word fragrance makes you think of a perfume or a flower. But the word smell, that could have a different meaning. That could be a good smell. It could be a bad smell. Um, you could say someone's proud or you could say someone is vain. They both mean kind of the same. Um, but, but being vain suggests that someone may be conceited. Um, being proud could be good or bad. Maybe you're proud of someone. Um, the word snoop and the words investigate. Um, snoop sounds like you're doing something that you probably shouldn't be. You're, you're not minding your own business. But if you're investigating something, that could be a good thing. So it just depends on um, how the word is being used. Um, and that helps you determine its connotative meaning. All right, so let's take a look at the gold watch, this little story. And we're going to look for um, words that we can determine their connotative meaning or we can determine their what they mean by the figurative language that's being used, okay? The Gold Watch by Matthew Allen. Sunlight burst through the window and woke Gabriel that bright summer day. He felt disoriented as if he had been sleeping for years. He didn't even know what time it was. But that was no surprise. He was always late. He pulled on his clothes and he went out into the yard where he found his mother sorting through boxes of old things. Why'd you get all that junk out of the garage? Gabriel asked. It's not junk, his mother answered. These are things I've saved over the years, but it's time to have a yard sale and let some things go. Gabriel's mother pulled a broken coffee maker out of the box, the electrical cord trailing behind it like a tail. Next, his mother held up a pocket watch as golden as a tiny sun. So I'm seeing the electrical cord trailing behind it like a tail. So the cord is being compared to the tail. And it's using the word like. Um, so this would be a simile. It gives the coffee maker the qualities of an animal. The word like tells me that this is like a simile. The comparison makes me picture the coffee maker as a cat, like with a tail that drags along the ground. Then I see next his mother held up a pocket watch as golden as a tiny sun. So the sun and the watch are being compared. Now, how would they be alike? Let's take a look at our question first. To what does the author compare the electrical cord and how does this make you imagine the coffee maker? I mean, it compares it like a tail, kind of helps you think on an animal. And it's a simile. And now let's look at the pocket watch and the sun. How are they alike? Well, it tells me that they're golden. So I would say that both are golden. Yellow color. So that would tell me that this watch is shiny and golden. So... Uh, when you see a simile or some type of figurative language, you determine what's being compared and what they would have in common. And you think through what is it that the author wants you to, what, why did they use that, that comparison? What is it that they're wanting you to, um, to notice? All right, let's keep reading. And the close reading is having us circle positive words that describe the watch and then 
draw a box around the negative word. So think about the feelings these words suggest. This old thing was your grandfather's. Okay, so negative words. I'm going to draw a box around old. This old is kind of a negative thing, she said, smiling at the watch like it was a familiar friend. Well, I'm going to draw a circle around familiar friend because that's definitely positive. I don't think it works. I suppose people would think it's pretty worthless. Mm, pretty worthless sounds negative. So I'm going to draw a box around that. But Gabriel asked his mother for the time, wound up the watch, and he let it swing from its chain like a pendulum. The ticking sound it made was as steady as a heartbeat. Hmm. You want your heartbeat to be steady. So I'm going to say that that's positive. Just then, some storm clouds crossed the sun, heavy with the rain of a summer storm. But Gabriel now had a new treasure. Well, I know that anytime I find a treasure, that's positive. Which he polished it until it shined and he tucked it carefully into his pocket so he would always know the time. All right, so let's review these words that we marked above and does it the boy see the watch in a positive or negative way. All right, so she says this old thing. It could be like a familiar friend, but she says it's worthless. But this is what the boy says. Um, that the ticking sound it was making was steady as a heartbeat. And now he had a new treasure. So which word from the story best describes how Gabriel feels about the watch? Does he feel like it's a treasure, that it's worthless, it's heartbeat or it's familiar. Well, I'm going to go with the word treasure since it says he has found a new treasure. That one's almost too easy, right? All right, so what you're going to do today with the second story is similar to the work that we just did from an excerpt from To Build a Fire by Jack London. You're going to read this passage and then you're going to answer questions. And most of these questions are going to deal with word meanings like um, the connotative meaning or um, whether it's a figurative language and what um, it's saying to you and what the meaning would be. Um, let's see if I can um, show you real quick what that passage is going to look like, what your form is going to look like. So here we go. And here's from Beauty and the Beast. You have five questions to answer, and then um, the second story um, from To Build a Fire, and then you will submit. Okay, have fun. Take your time, because this will be counted as a quiz grade.